Hi, Jimmy. Hi. <laughs> Jimmy, what were some of your musical influences? My first musical influences all came, ironically enough, I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, and it came from the radio from New Orleans. Uh, in those days, uh, black R&D in New Orleans was the Neville Brothers, Benny Spellman, Ernie Cato. So those were bands that would play our proms and, and played up and down the coast. So more than anything else, those are my early influences and still are some of my favorite music. Let's talk a little bit about the Neville Brothers, which I've read is one of your favorite bands oh, yeah. and certainly is one of mine. Yeah. Just one second. Okay. I got a bad kick off that artwork. Okay. Sorry, you might want to take that first question. Again. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Jimmy, who were some of your musical influences? Uh, early days on, from growing up in Mobile, Alabama, was the radio station. I think at that time it was WTIX out of New Orleans because they played all old New Orleans R&B, and those were the bands that would always play our proms and things, the Neville Brothers, Ernie Cato, Benny Spellman, Irma Thomas. So all of those bands uh, seem to have a lasting effect. They were, they were my favorite then and still is probably one of my favorite kinds of music. Let's talk a little bit about the Neville Brothers. I read that you've been working with them recently. What's that like? It's great. Uh, I've known uh, Art since those days, since we worked on Bourbon Street together in, in, in the late 60s. And uh, I, I think once you go to New Orleans, it's like, uh, I looked at every other city in the South where, where all my friends were going to school. I said, boy, all those people are going there. I'm not going. And New Orleans was always the melting pot of the real sort of offbeat Southern kids. I mean, if you were a little bit strange in any degree, you naturally had a tendency to migrate to New Orleans. So there was a great uh, influx of, there were, there were great bars where you could find such a great mixture of people that all of a sudden attached itself to the music of the town. And once you do that and you leave, I think you always take it with you. So it was great. I listened to the Neville Brothers for a long time before, and, and had really gone out of contact with, with Art for a while until uh, I went back down to do some writing there and came up with an idea to try to put some other things into production. They'd always been a band that every, was, seemed to be everybody's favorite, but couldn't quite get into the studio and get any kind of thing captured. Uh, and we went in and did some things which I thought were very good, but at the time, whatever the powers may be at record companies, uh, a guy told me about the Neville Brothers that they weren't black enough. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm holding on to the tape, you know, until things change. But that, that's an amazing statement to make to me, you know, but that's the way uh, A&R people were thinking at the time. But we still work together. In fact, we're playing a show at the Super Bowl together. And one of these days, uh, I hope to have satisfaction of saying I had something to do with him finally making it. How would, uh, how would you describe the music of the Neville Brothers, and how, has, <clears throat> how have you influenced that, have you in working with them at all? I just uh, I call it swamp music. And uh, I think that they're, they're, New Orleans is a great music town. And when I, when I moved there when I was a teenager and started playing and getting into the musical circles there, it has a great uh, combination of, of, you've got a, a form of music, uh, you've got Cajun music and you've got Zydeco music from the bayous and, and you've got great jazz. So there's, it's one of the great musical melting pots still left where you can go out on a given night today and see good bands that are being fostered there in 10 or 12 clubs and not many other towns, maybe even New York, that you can do that. So music has been a, is always a part of the life there. It really is. And, and it's really reflective in, in why you listen to it. And, uh, and I think that the Nevilles bring into that, it's, it's a gumbo to me. I mean, you got a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and stir it all up, and it usually comes out real good. Let's talk about, let's talk about another city that you've been involved in. I, I read a quote that you said, there's a lot of misconception about Nashville, because whenever you hear Nashville, you think country. And that doesn't seem true to you. Can you talk about that? <clears> no, it doesn't seem true to me. I, uh, I, get, I listen to country radio stations now and I go, well, God, we started that stuff 10 years ago. Uh, and, and then I was in Nashville. Surely I, got, I went there primarily because I didn't have enough money to get gas to go to California. And that's the truth. So I had a deal waiting for me in Nashville or Los Angeles and I went to Nashville. But I, again, I started associating myself with people that were just on the other fringes of the music. There, there's a great amount of music, un, probably unbeknownst to a lot of people that comes out of there that's not, per se, country music. I, I, just, I consider it the layers of music in Nashville. It's like a wrapped telephone cable. There are a lot of smaller cables inside, but they all make up one big thing called music of Nashville. So, you, but you've got room. It's a lot more tolerant now, and there's a lot more 
uh, freshness coming into it. I think one thing that, that has a tendency that I saw, because I worked for Billboard magazine there for a while, so I was a, a reporter, uh, was a lot of people there have a tendency to live on one song forever, you know, and which, which cuts down on input and excitement. So I, I always try to keep things fresh and still do and imaginative. If there's any one thing about the music that, that could stand some improvement, it's just not to get into a, a lazy situation, to always try to be fresh. What sort of, is there a, is there a big bar scene in Nashville? You're asking me about bars. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing that you've never been to a bar, we thought maybe you had heard of one. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's an amazing thing. There used to be a club in Nashville that was called the Exit Inn, which was one of the only live performing clubs. Uh, and before that, just a very few coffee houses. Music was made there, and I always said it was made in studios, but it wasn't played in the streets. And then there's a, there's a great music school at Tennessee State University, and there was a great jazz scene in Nashville. But you always tend, because of the way media presents things, it always focuses on one or two things, you know. And uh, that's always was one of my peeves and things I tried to do when I would work for the newspaper, was to try to show that there were a lot more other sides of it. There is more so now down there. there there's some great uh, clubs around town where there is a, a local following. I have a good friend who I write with named Marshall Chapman, a lady who's, who's really a fine performer. And I'm, I'm from the school of performing is where you cut your, cut your teeth and you know what you're doing up there. So I like to see that. And I'm, it, it's a lot better now than it was when I was there. Do you think session players, and, and certainly Nashville is, is full of them, <clears throat> do session players, does it seem to you like they, they go out and play bars or do they just practice their craft in a studio, do you think? Uh, most session players, I know if they're good, are working so much in the studio that any opportunity given to get a little input out of the day-to-day -day performing, I think, improves their performance. When I go down and use the few session players that I add to my band, I always try to make the environment when we record a little different than what they're used to. We roll the bar in, we go, I bring palm trees in and stick in the studio and, and make it more fun because the fun is reflective in the music. I want them to think of it as having a good time because that's all music ever was to me. I got in it to have a good time and meet girls years ago and it's still working. So, you know, I mean, a lot of things have changed, but when you get boil it right down to the core, that's why people want to do this, you know. And so I try to make that happen to stu studio players in Nashville, and so far it's worked pretty good. Let's talk a little bit about, about your music. Um, how, would, how would you describe your music? A lot of people have tried. It's sort of indescribable. It runs the gambit, like I said before. Somebody coined a phrase once, uh, Gulf and Western. And I guess that's probably as close. Or, or Swamp, uh, what do they call it? Swamp Rock or something like that. It's a combination of a lot of things. I write and I, and I record what I like to listen to and what influences me. Uh, as far as, and I always, I think at one point, I always wanted to be a writer before I ever thought about being a musician. So I, I try to put a lot of lit literary pieces into it and a lot of humor and it's it's sort of yarn spinning more than anything else and for years they've been trying to categorize me but it's just I sort of like that because it's not it doesn't fit into one category. What inspires you to write a song? Just open it up in the morning and listen it. <laughs> you know, all you got to do is look around it's out there. A lot, I think a lot of people I have a tendency to really listen and pick up you know on, on what's going on uh, more so than I think a lot of people because you know, a lot of people are very tunnel vision, and so I think if you just keep your ears open, there's a lot of funny things, there's a lot of tragic things, but if you just, I think you're a reflector of your times if you're a writer, and that's what I try to do, so it's all in there. I mean, that's why I think I can go from moods of real serious songs to completely outrageous things, because I really don't care, I mean, which way, I don't think about why I move in certain directions. When you're, when you're performing, um, when you're in concert, are you having as much fun as you appear to be having up there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, some days, <laughs> I can honestly say you, uh, you, you wonder why you did what you did the night before, but those days are rapidly becoming extinct, thank God. Uh, I don't know. This business was never known for much longevity. You know, I think uh, the life expectancy of a rock and roll player is probably about as much as a running back in the NFL, maybe three or four years. Because people have a tendency to get completely overexposed, and then it's, it's gone. We've hung on for 22 years. You know, I look. I used to remember when I'd go into to the store and have to pull my records out of the back when it was all B's. I knew that I was doing good when I had my own bin. You know, so from from that day on up to here, when it's just uh, it's been a kick and. 
And for so many years that I never got played on the radio, which is still true, but I have loyal, diehard fans that come see me. You know, I was ready to, to stop this stuff a few years ago. I just started of taper off, and hell, I got popular again. So, and our crowds are getting younger, and they come to go to a party and escape. And for those two hours I'm on the stage, I like to take them to Margaritaville. I mean, wherever they go any other time, they've, they've adopted a term for themselves as parrot heads because they dress up in these outlandish outfits and come out. It's a little bit above a dead head <laughs> in brain cell content. But, uh, so I play for them, and, and I have a great time on that stage. And I think you should. As a performer, that's what you're up there to do. It's my job. I have a great job, and I love it. What is Margaritaville? Uh, <laughs> soon to be a movie. <laughs> a major can I plug motion my picture. Film? Yes, you can. A major motion do. picture, cast of <laughs> thousand. It's uh, it was always a state of mind, you know. And uh, it never was really one particular place. It was a series of events, and I wrote it in five minutes. And I knew that it was. I knew I had something there when I wrote that song. But uh, it continues to, to, it's an amazing thing to me to see that it, it is sort of tacked on to people. It's, it's more than a song. It represents, I think, a little bit. I don't think there's anybody out there that wouldn't, uh, if given the opportunity, go to the beach for a couple of weeks, you know, no matter what you do. So I think it has some kind of a universal quality like that, a little bit. I, just, I didn't know what I had when I got it, but it, it has endured quite a bit. So I, I think that... It's not a theme that I'm trying to beat to death, but it's just, I think that a lot more and more people seem to enjoy the few minutes they get to spend in Margaritaville. So as long as it's working for them, it's fine with me. It's amazing. As, as I said to you earlier, I'm a big fan, and it's for that exact reason. I mean, I can put on one of your albums, and I can be sitting in the middle of the craziness of New York yeah. City, and all of a sudden be in Margaritaville. Or it's, just think about the tune. It's total escapism. Yeah. I make no bones about it. I mean, it's total escapism, and that's what it's there for. But it's also always telling a really nice story. Oh, yeah, and heroes don't get killed in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them. Let's talk a little bit about, about a favorite bar of yours, Captain Tony's, and that whole bar inspiration. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, actually, Captain Tony's now running for mayor of Key West, and I'm his honorary campaign manager. We're running the bartender for mayor. And uh, it was always a place in the first days when I went to Key West, when I migrated. I went from, from New Orleans when I left there and, and went to Key West, which was more of a literary town. It wasn't really a music town. Uh, most of the people down there were writers like Thomas McGuane, Jim Harrison, Russell Chatham. And, and I, I wound up there, and everybody seemed to migrate. There were two great bars, one called the Old Anchor Inn, and the other was Captain Tony's. And he was sort of like the street father. I mean, he was like... Uh, he would take anybody in. He was, you know, his old New Jersey sea captain had done everything, and uh, and it was really a reflective of why we all came to Key West in the first place. So every now and then, through all the changes in that town, I always sneak back in and have a drink with him and talk about things. And the one day that I was in there, we started talking about some old times. I used to get great ideas for songs from the bathroom wall in Captain Tony's. Wonderful graffiti. And I would, I remember one that one said, life and ink runs out at the same time, and it was signed the squid. <laughs> and I thought those kind of things were all over the wall. And from that, I went in and I started writing a song called Last Mango in Paris, which was about him and in that day in the bar, which is also a play on <laughs> another thing. But uh, it, it's... Uh, I think the great place to meet, to me, the way I write, and I like to live on the seacoast and I like to hang out in bars just because that's where life seems to, life always seems to gather on the edge. I don't have much interest in going out and seeing what's in the middle. I sort of like to hang on the edge. You know. So you could never live inland? You would just be unhappy? Well, I've done it, but no, God, yeah, I just, I think those, those things, that's the time you spend in purgatory. You have to go live in a trailer and sort out your socks and your underwear. You've lost over a hundred years. That, that's, no, if I, given the choice, I'll stay where I am. <laughs> how did you write and how did you come up with this great title, If the Phone Doesn't Ring, It's Me? Uh, all you gotta do is get your heart broke. <laughs> It worked. Uh, I don't, you know, it, it just came to me. I mean, I always love it. It's people in my band, and and I think it, it's a game a lot of people play. I'm surprised somebody hadn't picked up on it like Trivial Pursuit. But everybody, whether you can write a song or not, people seem to tend to want to try to come up with clever titles. And we're always bouncing those things back and forth when we're on the road. And it's always sort of a, here, I'll see you, my 
this title and then you can see that one. And I think it came out of one of those conversations and I came up with it because I love the double entendre in it. It's a great it makes you think. It's a great <laughs> title. Where, where are they? Where are they? <laughs> how, do you think, how do you think the South has affected rock and roll music and vice versa? Um, I think just for me, I can only speak for me and the influences and, and the people that I've known and, and come, because I started out just because for no other reason that I, 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 that's where I grew up and that's where I, I dropped in on the planet. But I, I really feel fortunate in that way that, that through the time period that I was down there, there was always a great uh, diversity of music. And I think music to me as a Southern growing up in those times was something that, that brought people together when at that time in the South you weren't supposed to be uh, having as good a time or being as free about intermingling blacks and whites or, or hippies and, and jazz musicians. It was, the, it was the one place where you could come together which was not uh, in those days in the South very popular to do. Music was the focal point. And I think people that went through that uh, and musicians were your friends and your comrades no matter who they were. I mean, we were one of the few elements that, that lived that way in, a, in an area at the time, fortunately, that has changed for the better, I hope. And uh, for that, music reflects. And, and then when you get over those times, it's just there's not a better place to go to than to get down and drink a cold beer and go listen to Junior Walker and the All-Stars or something. I mean, I like to get down and go to small bars. And all over the South, I think, and I hope that that's, you know, you go through periods of time that, that it's not there. But a club scene in the South, there's nothing like it. I mean, I remember when I was a kid going to see the James Brown Review uh, when Tammy Terrell was singing with him, you know. And it was always a place where you could go. And then in, in any given club, you could go to clubs down the roads. And that'd be, uh, uh, there, were, there were great beach bands in those days called Beach Music, came out of the Carolinas, the Tams, uh, uh, God, what was the other? The Swing of Medallions, and then you had Macon. I mean, there was, there was such a dichotomy of music in the South in those days. And I loved every bit of it. And, and it's fun to go back and, and I was the king of Mardi Gras once and got on the riverboat with the Neville brothers playing on the riverboat, you know, at my coronation. <laughs> and it was, then we got up and everybody came and everybody played. It's like a party and it's like family. If there's anything that's reflective of Southern tradition when it goes to music, it's everybody loves to jam. And uh, that I love about it and I think that's one of the strongest, that's why it's a lasting type of music and whatever, whether it's country, whether it's New Orleans music or jazz or, or hardcore rock and roll, done with a little bit of southern flair, it has a little more hominess to it, I think. And that's, that's why I love it as my influences. It seems like a lot of the, the early architects of mm -hmm. rock and roll, Bo Diddley <coughs> and Little Richard and Jerry Lee and Elvis, uh, <clears throat> for example, were all from the South, and it sort of was born there. Yeah. Is it, is it all directly related? It's the only to way to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or be a baseball player. Um, yeah, I guess it comes from a rural, a rural simplicity. I mean, and yarn spinning. I mean, it goes back to Mark Twain was the first uh, literary showman. I mean, he wrote, produced, and directed. I mean, he was the king of video, you know, when there wasn't any video. And he would take the yarns and the tales that he'd go around and listen at the general store or the bar, and he'd put them into a show. And I think he, he's the first great Southern musician. I mean, it might seem ironic, but... Uh, I'm a big Mark Twain fan because of that reason. And it came out of rural beginnings, and I think in those days it was the only form of, of entertainment was yarn spinning or somebody doing a little dance. And everybody needs music in their lives. I mean, if they cut it off tomorrow, everywhere, we go crazy. It's, a very, you know, it's very essentially a part of our structure. And uh, so all those early days that people came out of that, I think it, because there is a little more sense of family, I think, in the South and a little more sense of home, and those were the places where you're early, you know, and, and let's face it, to go off and be a musician was not exactly a role model job in those days, and still to this day probably isn't either. But in.